Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to find ourselves in Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter 12, number 16. And we're going to read, uh, starting in verse number 9. Jesus had just got done feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves and a few fish. That's where we're going to pick up our reading today. And, um, you know, I had a couple guys here picking on me a little bit. You know, my, my wife helps me so much. And one of the things that she helps me do, she helps keep the books. So when I'm away on a mission trip or on a way from evangelism, you know, someone's got to stay put and keep, keep track of all those things for me. And so they were kind of teasing me, but it reminded me of a, a joke I heard where uh, all the husbands in the world who were saved were at Heaven's Gate. And an angel walked up to... Uh, all of them and said, now all you men who allowed your wife to rule the roost and be your boss, I want you to stand in line number one. And then he said that all you men who were the boss of your home and, and were the ones that took the responsibility that God says to us in his word, I want you to stand in line number two. Well, in line number one, where all the husbands allowed their wives to rule the roost, was like hundreds and hundreds of miles long. You couldn't even see the end of it. And there was one guy, only one husband, that stood in the line where he was the boss of his family. And the angel looked at all the people, all the husbands that let their wives rule over them, and said, man, you need to be ashamed of yourself. And so he looks at the man who was over there by himself and said, tell all these men why it is you're standing in this line and, and why it was that you were the boss of your home. And he looked at the angel, and he looked at all those men and said, the only reason why I'm standing in this line is because this is where my wife told me to stand. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. <laughs> boy, oh boy. All right. If you're able to stand, if you're able, if you're not able, don't worry. No one's going to think anything different of you. But if you're able to stand, I want us to stand to honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to find ourselves in Matthew 16, verse 9. Jesus said, do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spoke it not to you concerning the bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, the physical leaven, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or the teaching. In verse 13 it says, that when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, are you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to bring you a message entitled, The Greatest Question That Has Ever Been Asked. The greatest question that has ever been asked that demands the greatest answer ever given. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. Lord, I pray once again, declaring that I have nothing, I am nothing, I can be nothing. Lord, I cannot muster anything on my own. You tell us in your word that the flesh profits nothing, but Lord, it's your spirit that quickens. So Father, I pray now for your hand of anointing to be upon me. I pray, Lord, that you'll turn my gift on that you've given. I pray, Lord, that you'll help me preach in the power of your spirit. I pray, Lord, that your word would go forth in power, that, Lord, it would truly be magnified in the hearts and minds of everyone that is here. I pray, Lord, with all my heart that you'll grant crystal understanding, clarity in the hearts and minds, Lord, of this message and who it is that you are. And Father, I pray with all my heart that if there's anyone that's lost that does not know you today, that, Lord, this would be the day that they would acknowledge to you that they are a sinner. For you tell us in your word, for all have sinned and fallen short of your standard. And that the wages of sin is death and hell forever. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Lord, I just pray that you'll grant them repentance, a willingness to turn from sin and self. And, Lord, help them to put all their confidence in your son Jesus, his finished work on the cross, where he went and died in their place, took all their sins, past, present, and future. 
Lord, died in their place, shed your blood that we might have forgiveness of sin, received all the wrath and the punishment that we deserved upon yourself. And Lord, you even said on the cross that the work and pain for sin was finished, completely finished. Father, give them the faith to believe that you died. Give them the faith to believe that your son was buried. Give them the faith to believe today that Jesus Christ, you, God, raised him from the dead and has set him at the right hand of God. And Lord, I pray that you'll help them call upon your name. And Lord, as you tell us in Romans, for all those that call upon your name shall be saved. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, no. No, I guess I'm not. There it is. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Pastor. All right. All right. Well, somebody's out there freaking well. It's a good thing he's got a big mouth. Amen? <laughs> I heard him without a microphone. Boy. This is true. All right. Well, here in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 15, specifically, Jesus Christ asked the most single, important, greatest question that was ever asked. The reason why it's the greatest question because it's the greatest one that is asking this question. And it received the greatest answer ever given. But this answer that was given demands the greatest response that a human being can make according to the answer that was given that Jesus Christ, the greatest of the great, asked. And Jesus, as I've said, was just, just got done feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves, a few fish, a miracle has taken place. And Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread that has come down out of heaven. And the Bible says that Bethlehem is where he was born. Well, Bethlehem means, uh, the, it means the, the house of bread. Well, Jesus came and occupied the house of bread for 33 and a half years while he lived here on earth. And Jesus taught so many things about who he was, about how to get to heaven, that it's all been recorded for us here in the Bible, the book of eternity, the eternal, infallible, inerrant word of God. And then he turns to his disciples and says, listen, you need to be aware of the teaching of the Sadducees and Pharisees because the teaching that they're going to teach you will damn your soul. You see, they taught that a person gets to heaven by good works, by being good, by obeying the Ten Commandments, trying to make themselves better or more presentable to the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Good works, all those things are not going to cleanse anyone's soul from sin. You see... You can have all the doctrines in the Word of God absolutely 100% correct, but if you miss and misunderstand the doctrine of who Jesus Christ really is, you will have failed life and you will have failed eternity. God does not want you to fail eternity. God does not want you to fail eternal life. He wants you to pass. He's given us an open book test so that we can pass this test. Amen? Now, most tests you take in life, there's a redo. You can take... Uh, another examination. But this test, there's no do-overs. If you quit breathing air and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will have failed life and you will have failed eternity. The Bible says that it's God's will that none should perish, none go to hell, but that it's His will that all should come to repentance. All should be willing to come to a place where they can acknowledge that they're guilty of sin and turn to the Lord Jesus, acknowledge His Work on the cross where he went, took their sin, bore in his body the world's sin, your sin, my sin, and died in our place, was punished in our place, so that you and I would not have to be punished in hell forever. And God could freely pour out his grace and mercy because all sin was dealt with and that God remains just. Amen? And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, turn from sin and self, call upon his name, and the Bible says all those that do that God will save. But if you're in here this morning thinking, hey, I'm going to get to heaven because I've been baptized, I've done the catechism, I've done the Eucharist, I've confessed my sins to somebody, I'm doing good, I'm obeying God's law, I'm turning over a new leaf, I'm trying harder, I'm doing the best I can, you will not go to heaven, you will go to hell if you put your trust in that. Jesus said in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you are saved by grace, God's unconditional love, through faith, a trust in God's word, trusting in what God says. You're saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. At least anybody should boast or brag. In fact, the Bible goes on to say in Romans 3.27, listen now, therefore we conclude that a man or a person is justified, declared innocent by God through faith or trust in who God is and trust in who Jesus is without the deeds 
or the doing of God's law. Amen? Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. So, God gives to us and tells us very clearly that a person is saved by his grace and his mercy alone. God is not interested in your denomination. He's interested in your destination. And there are no such thing as denominations in heaven. There's only born again, blood-washed, repentant believers who have put all their trust and all of their hope in Jesus Christ, the person, has finished work on the cross with a belief in their heart that God raised him from the dead, and they have turned from sin and self and have surrendered their heart and their life to him. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, Jesus... And Matthew 16 gathers his disciples together. And he says, listen, this is the test. This test has one question in two parts. It absolutely needs the right answer. And there's only one response that I'm going to accept to the answer that's given to this test. So this same test that Jesus gave his disciples is the same test that he's giving us right here this morning. Now, are you ready for the test? Here's the test. Look at verse 15 now. Jesus says... Who do you say that I am? In other words, who is Jesus Christ to you this morning? Who is he to you? Who is he really to you? You see, what you perceive about Jesus Christ, what you really believe about Jesus Christ, will determine how you conduct yourself privately and publicly. But how you make decisions, how you raise your family. The things that you're going to do are going to all be based on what you truly believe and who you believe Jesus Christ really is. You see, you can say you believe the Bible, you can quote the Bible, but people really know what you believe about Christ based on how you live your life more than anything else. Amen? Amen. Now, praise God for an open book test. Amen? Boy. And Jesus defines eternal life. He says, to know the one true God and the Son in whom he sent. You see, eternal life is not just length of days, but it's the quality that life gives. Knowing God brings nothing but quality to your life. Amen? And that's a lack of a better word. Quality is not a word that really defines how awesome God really is and what he truly does for your life. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly right now, present tense. Now that doesn't mean he's going to fill up your house. doesn't mean he's going to give you a big house. doesn't mean that you're not going to have pain, suffering, and sorrow. But what it does mean is that Christ is with you, Christ is in you, and Christ will conform your life and your soul into his image every single day. Amen. Amen. Amen? He has to live his life in and through us, or we cannot be Christians, and we cannot do what only he can do. Amen? It's the great exchange. It's allowing Christ to have first place in your heart and life, and allow him to live his life out through the body that he has purchased. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, let's answer the question. It's one question in two parts. Christ, who is he really? All right, well, Jesus asked one point of view, and first of all, we're going to look at the world's point of view. What does the world say, and what does the world say that Jesus is and who he really is? Well, let's look at the world's view, because Christ wanted to know what men thought. Look at verse 13. He asked his disciples and said, Who do men, or what does the world say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now look at the world's response according to verse number 14. Some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Others say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So the world has all kinds of opinions about who Jesus Christ is. Back in the first century, they also had many opinions of who Jesus Christ was. The wise men saw Jesus Christ as a prophet, king, and priest, and indeed he was. King Herod saw Jesus as a political threat, murdered all the two-year-olds and under. You talk about the Grinch that tried to steal Christmas, he would fit the bill, amen? <laughs> Herod saw him as a political threat. To the townspeople of Nazareth, Jesus Christ was just a carpenter's son, the son of Mary, the son of Joseph, even to the point where one said, can anything good come from Nazareth because it has such a rotten reputation? To the Pharisees, some of them saw him as the son of David, but the majority of them saw him as the son of an adulterer. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night, saw Jesus as a good teacher. The multitude saw Jesus Christ as a prophet, some as a miracle worker, some as a healer. Others saw him as a criminal. Judas Iscariot saw Jesus Christ as a good master or just a good teacher. If you study the life of Judas Iscariot, not one time did he call Jesus Lord. All other 11 disciples called him Lord, but Judas did not. Pontius Pilate, 
The governor of that Jewish providence saw Jesus as just a man. After he was flogged and beaten, he presented Jesus to the people and he said, Behold the man. That's how Pilate saw Jesus Christ. The rebels or the guerrillas in warfare see Jesus Christ as a revolutionist trying to free everyone from poverty. The rock and roll crowds see Jesus as a superstar, one to be mocked and one to be ridiculed. To a lot of Baptists, Catholic, Episcopals, Methodists, Presbyterians, Jesus is just the old man sitting in a rocking chair upstairs. How sad is that? The agnostics see him as a higher power. The atheists see him as non-existent. Even during this season, listen, I'm all, for, I'm all for fiction. I'm all for kids having fun. I'm all for kids for using their imagination, so I'm not beating them up. But as our dear brother here said, the reality is Jesus Christ is the reason for every season. Amen? It's not about Santa. It's about our Savior. It's not about Christmas trees. It's about the one who hung on the tree, the Calvary's cross. Amen? It's not about ornaments. It's about the Alpha and the Omega. It's not about reindeer. It's about our Redeemer. It's not about elves. It's about Emmanuel, God with us. Amen? Amen. Christmas is the reason that we exist. Christmas is the reason that we have hope. Christmas is the reason that we can stand here and proclaim boldly the Word of God and the good news that people can be saved, forgiven of all their sin, delivered from hell forever. Amen? Amen. Now, that's what the world said in the first century, but what does the world say about Jesus Christ in the 21st century, Brother Dave? Well, there's all kinds of views today about who Jesus is. And listen to me. The world always gets it wrong. Are you with me? The world always gets it wrong. Mormons believe that Jesus is a man who is becoming a God. He's still evolving. Elohim, the God they say they worship, was just a man who is still evolving into God, being more like God every day, one of millions. They believe in millions and millions of gods. Christian scientists see Jesus Christ as a divine idea. The Jehovah Witnesses see Jesus as the Archangel Michael and even say that Jesus and Satan are brothers. Boy. New Agers see Jesus as an advanced medium. The Buddhists see him as a prophet who achieved nirvana or godhood. The Muslims see Jesus Christ, one of many prophets that spoke for God. That's how they see him. The Unitarians see Jesus as an exceptionally good man. To the witches... He's a good witch that works white magic to the rebels or the gorillas. He's that revolutionist that frees them from poverty. So on and on, the Word of God teaches us what people say, the world says, about Jesus Christ. The world gets it wrong. That's why Jesus says, Beware, many false prophets will come in my name and say, Jesus is here, Jesus is there, but don't listen to them. Jesus right now is sitting on the right hand of God in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. But that still doesn't answer our question, does it? What the world says, what they say, what people think. Who is Jesus Christ really? Well, Jesus takes that same question and now asks in a different way. We've seen what the world says about Christ, but now more importantly, let's look at what the Word of God says about Jesus Christ and who He really is. Are you with me? Now, there's two voices you're going to listen to, either Satan's voice which represents the world, are you going to listen to our Savior's voice, which represents the Word of God, the Holy Bible? Amen? Those are the only two voices that you can listen to, or choose to listen to, and we pray that today you listen to God's Word. Now, we'll look at verse 15 because he asked the question, Who do you say that I am? So he's asking his disciples directly. Christ is asking us directly, Who do you say that I, Jesus Christ, really am? Look at verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, listen to this now, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now back in those days, when somebody was the son of, of, of a person that had a trade, they automatically were assumed that their son did identically what their father did. So when the expression is given, he's the Son of the living God, that's a statement saying that Jesus Christ indeed is God and that he is deity. Now, verse 17, this is what Jesus said to that answer. Cursed art thou? Did he say that to Peter? Cursed art thou? No, he said what? Blessed art thou, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But listen now, but my Father, Father God in heaven, who is in heaven. 
So the answer didn't come from a human being. The answer didn't come from somebody of the world. No, the answer came directly from God the Father and said, This is my beloved Son, and whom I'm well pleased. He received the answer by God the Father himself. So in other words, Peter, you passed the test. You exactly got it absolutely correct because you got your answer from God and not the world. Amen? You see, this test... Don't forget now, it's not just answering the question correctly, but it's also responding to the correct answer that is given. Jesus goes on to say in verse 18, And I say also unto thee, thou art Petros, in the Greek. Thou art a little pebble, Peter. That's what Jesus said. Hey, Peter, that statement that you just made about me being the son of the living God, that statement that God the Father gave you directly from heaven himself, hey, I want you to know, Peter, you're just a little pebble, man. And then he goes on and says this, he says, and upon this rock, Petra, which means a boulder. And when you look in the Greek, the Lord is referring to himself. He's saying, Peter, you're a pebble, but I want you to know that I'm a rock. I'm the boulder that does not move. I'm the rock of ages. I'm that rock from eternity past to eternity future. And then he says this, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what Jesus was saying is, listen, upon the statement, Peter, that you made of me, that statement that I'm the son of the living God, that I am God in the flesh, that's the statement that I'm going to build my church on, and that is the statement that the gates of hell will not and cannot prevail against. Amen? Boy. Now, in other words, Jesus was saying, listen, I am the son of God. I am God himself. So, when Peter made that statement that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, there is no question that he was saying that Jesus Christ is indeed God in the flesh. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That word begotten is used five times, if I'm not mistaken, in the Word of God. And it literally means unique, special, or one-of-a-kind Son. You see, Christ did not come into existence when he was born by the Virgin Mary, No. Christ existed from eternity past and will exist to eternity future. In fact, John the Baptist, when he was saying, hey, there's one that's coming after me whose shoes or sandals I'm unworthy to unlatch, unlatch, he says, that one, Christ, existed before I did. Now, John the Baptist was born nine months before Jesus was, amen? So John the Baptist is saying, hey, there's something else going on here. He's not just a man. I want you to understand the one that's showing up in the flesh is God Almighty Himself. The Bible goes on to say this, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Listen to what, the, listen to what God's Word says now. It says, Let this mind be in you also, which was in Christ Jesus. Listen, who being in the form, or literally, who being in the very essence or nature of God himself. Listen, you can't be the very essence or the nature of God unless you are God. Amen? So it goes on to say, who being in the form or the very nature of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, but made himself of no reputation. See, he wasn't forced to come down here. He wasn't made to come down here. The Bible says he made himself of no reputation. In fact, Jesus said, no man takes my life, I willingly lay it down. Amen? And he goes on to say, and he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, which literally means that he became the worst of the worst criminals. He really literally took the sinner's place. He took my place. He took your place. He literally took our sin, as the Bible says that Peter bore it in his body, and the wrath of God fell on Christ on the cross. He was forsook by God on the cross, and yet the Word of God says that he died, he was buried, and he was raised again. Why? Because he was the sinless Son of God. He himself did not sin, but he died in place of our sin. Amen? Amen. Now, the Word of God has a lot to say about Christ and understanding who he really, truly is is. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. That word beginning doesn't mean a starting point. It literally means origin. God has always existed. He's the origin of all things. All things were made by Him. Not one thing was made without Him. All things consist and are held together by Him. So, it literally means in the beginning. He's the very origin of all things because He existed before all things. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Now the Bible says that God is from everlasting to everlasting. So there's never a time where God can cease being God. Amen? He can't. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, and the Word, God, became flesh. In other words, when God Almighty, Jesus Christ, stepped into the womb of the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit wrapped perfect humanity around perfect deity. He never ceased being God, but He started being a perfect human being. You see, God can't die, but a human body can die and bleed. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So He had to have a body. He had to also live a perfect life and fulfill God's requirements, which was perfection, which all of us have fallen short to do. And He did what we could not do. He paid the debt that we could not pay. He did it all for us because He loves you. Amen? Amen. 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 And John, or in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, there's 333 different prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ. And some of those prophecies, when they're quoted, when you see them, it reveals who Jesus Christ really is. Listen to this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulder. And the Bible goes on to say, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Bible goes on to say in Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, concerning Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. God sent His Son into the world. The Holy Spirit wrapped human, human, perfect humanity around perfect deity. Christ was born. Now listen to this prophecy concerning that event. It says, But thou, Bethlehem, yet out of thee shall he, Christ, come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel. Alright, Christ is coming. Christ is going to be the ruler in Israel. God the Father appointed this. Now listen to what it says about where he comes from. Whose goings forth have been of old, even from everlasting. You see, that little baby didn't start in the manger, no. Jesus Christ has always been the eternal Son of God for all eternity. Amen? Amen. He always has been God and always will be God and will remain God. And nothing will ever change about the fact that he is indeed God. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, For in him Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, or the Godhead bodily. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, the Word of God says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Over and over again, the Word of God tells us who he is. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, the Bible says that his name is the Word of God. Amen? In Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 3, the Bible says, speaking of John the Baptist, I heard the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Amen? So when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist was saying, Behold, here is your God in the flesh who became one of us so that he can live the life that you and I could not live, rescue us from a devil's hell for all eternity so that we can live with him and be with him forever in heaven. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, Brother Dave, how can he be fully God and fully man at the same time? I mean, how can two different natures exist in perfect harmony and one person named Jesus Christ? That's a great question. That's a question that I can't wrap my mind around completely. That's a question that I can't answer completely, but listen to this. Nowhere in Scripture does God say you have to understand everything He said. He said you've got to believe it. Amen? Amen? Boy, now listen, I don't understand electricity. I really don't. I know it can kill you if you touch the wrong water. I don't walk around in the dark because I don't understand it. Amen? Amen? I don't understand how a multi-ton airplane that you know weighs tons and tons can get up off the ground and fly in the air. I don't know how them jet engines work. I don't. But I guarantee you I'm not going to swim across the Atlantic to go to England if God calls me there. Amen? <laughs> Just because I don't understand how it all works. You ladies, do you understand your car and how that motor works and all the parts in it? Do you understand completely how all that works? Nope. But does it keep you from going to the mall and shopping, amen? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Amen. You just say, hey, look, if I get in here and push that, man, I go. If I push on that one, I stop, amen? What else is there to know, right, Brother Dave? 
We're going shopping, man. That's all that matters. Amen? So God didn't tell us that we had to understand everything, but He didn't say believe it. Someone said, God said it, therefore I believe it. No. God said it whether you believe it or not. It's true. Amen? Boy, it's true. Now, I like when I heard one man say, if you try to figure out how Jesus can be fully God and fully man and one person, you will lose your mind. But if you spend your time trying to deny the reality of that, you will lose your soul forever in hell. Boy, how do I know? Listen, John wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to prove the deity of Christ, to show who he really was. And in 2 John, that same John that wrote the Gospel of John says this, Listen, for many deceivers have gone into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. Verse John 1, 9, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word, God, became flesh. Listen, who do not confess Jesus is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So if anyone denies that Jesus Christ is God Almighty, the one true living God, in the flesh, they're a deceiver, they're an antichrist, they're deceived themselves, and they're in desperate need of getting born again so that they can be forgiven and go to heaven themselves. Are you with me? In fact, God is so, so uh, hard on people that want to twist and mess with the Scripture. Listen to what it says. The unlearned and the unstable twist the Scriptures to their own destruction. You see, it's one thing to get a test wrong at school. It's one thing to say, hey, I can make that up. It's one thing to get an F, and yet life goes on. But my friend, listen to me. When you take your last breath, there is no makeup. There are no takeovers. This is absolutely depending upon your eternity, your soul, and the truth of God's Word. Amen? Amen. So it's not just having the facts and the theology of Jesus in your head, but it's truly making sure that Jesus Christ is a reality in your heart and that there's been a day in your life where you knew God convicted you, God convinced you that you were guilty, that you knew you were lost and undone, that you were on your way to hell, and that you knew that you had to turn from sin and self and trust in the Savior. You believe what He did for you on Calvary's cross. You believe that He died. You believe that He was buried. You believe in your heart of hearts that God was raised from the dead. And you took your tongue and confessed him as Lord, asked Christ to save you and forgive you. And if that's taken place, I can guarantee you your life has changed and is still in the process of changing. How do I know? If anyone be in Christ, behold, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Are you with me, church? Yes. Amen? Boy. Guys, John takes out his pen. And let me just say it this way to you. He proves, without a doubt, that Jesus Christ is God. We can see that in the miracles of Christ. In John chapter 2, he turns water into wine. Who have you seen doing that lately? Amen? In John chapter number 4, Jesus heals the nobleman's son. In John chapter 5, Jesus forgives sins. And only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, I have the authority on earth to forgive sins. In John chapter 6, Jesus walks on water. In John chapter 6, again, we, we see him feeding 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish. Who else can do that but God? Amen? In John chapter 9, Jesus to a blind man. In John chapter 11, he calls a man Lazarus from the dead who's been dead for four days. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. We see it in the miracles, but we also see it in the message. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And he that cometh unto me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst again. In John chapter 10, verse number 7, Jesus says, I am the door of heaven. In other words, I'm the only way, I'm the only life, and I am the only truth, and I am the only one that you can come to that you might have life and have it more abundantly and have forgiveness for your soul's sins. Amen? Amen. Boy. In John chapter number 10, verse 14, I'm the good shepherd. John chapter 11, verse 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live, Jesus said. In John 14, 6, I've just quoted it, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father, no one gets into heaven except through me. John 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I'm the true vine. You see, he is fully God, and he is fully man. He's the God-man, or he's the man who was God. Are you with me? You see, in the Gospels, we see that Jesus Christ is veiled in humanity. His deity is veiled in humanity. But in the book of Revelation, we see that his, his deity is completely revealed to us, and we see him as he really is. But you see, Jesus was man enough 
He was 100% man, but he was man enough to get thirsty, but he was God enough to say, Come unto me, all ye that are, are, are come and drink of the water that I give thee, and you shall never thirst again. He was man enough to get hungry, but God enough to say, I'm the bread of life that comes down out of heaven. He was man enough to get tired, but Jesus said, I'm also fully God, and I'm telling ye, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Are you with me? Yes, yes. He was man enough to be tempted, and yet all points, yet he was God, fully God, to remain absolutely sinless. He was man, God enough, or man enough to feel the pain and the piercing and the beating and the mocking, but he was God enough to receive all praise in the book of Revelation. He is fully God, and he is fully man. You see, in the gospel, some people just saw him as a good man, but in the book of Revelation, we see him for who he really is, God Almighty. In the Gospels, we see Jesus Christ receiving a crown of thorns. But in Revelation, we see many gold crowns being thrown at His feet. In the Gospels, Jesus Christ is pierced. But in Revelation, He's praised forever and ever. In the Gospels, Jesus Christ is seen as a pulper. But in the book of Revelation, we see Him as He really is. He is the Prince of Peace. In the Gospels, Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews. But in Revelation, the Bible says He is the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. He is the God-man. Amen? Amen? That's who He is. One man put it this way, and then I'll close. When Jesus was 12 years old, He went down to the temple, and He talked to all the doctors and all the lawyers and all the big shots of that day. Remember that? And could you just imagine the conversation if you'll allow me to use my sanctified imagination just for a little bit? Could you imagine when they said, hey, now Jesus, what's your name? And then he said, listen to me. You've got to understand, I'm fully man and I'm fully God. I've always been God, always will be God. There's never a time in my existence where I was not God. But I started being a man and just a little while ago, 12 years ago, when the Holy Spirit wrapped perfect humanity around perfect deity. So you've got to understand that I'm God, but that I'm also fully man. So when you ask me my name, I'm going to tell it to you this way. On my mother's side, my name is Jesus. Amen? But on my father's side, I'm Emmanuel, God with you. Well, now, Jesus, you're getting a little too smart now. Where, 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 where are you from? Well, on my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem. But on my father's side, I'm from the very portals of heaven itself. Amen? Well, now, what's your profession? Well... You know, on my mother's side, I'm a carpenter. But on my father's side, I'm the creator of the world, and there was not one thing made that was not made without me. Amen? Well, yeah. now, Jesus, one last question now. How old are you? Well, on my mother's side, I'm 12 years old. But on my father's side, I'm from eternity to eternity. I am God Almighty in the flesh, the one that made you. The one that loved you. The one that sent my son, Jesus Christ, for you. The one that went to the cross on his own, willingly, to lay down his life. To take your sin. To take your punishment. To receive all the wrath of God against sin on Calvary's cross. And that's what I like to tell people. Listen, if I'm good and you're good, then explain Calvary. Because Calvary tells us that we're not good. Calvary tells us that it's futile to try to save yourself. In fact, God said... Salvation with men is impossible. But praise the Lord, he goes on to say, but with God all things are possible. And he came to earth, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, did what we could not do, paid the debt that we could not pay so that you and I could be rescued from hell. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> He's the God of man. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. And as they begin right now to come and, and prepare to <laughs> sing this hymnal and to sing the invitation song, Lord, I pray with all my heart that if there's anyone in this building that's lost today, that does not truly know you as Lord and Savior, that, Lord, this would be the day that they would truly come and admit to you that they are guilty and that they can't save themselves. And that, Lord, you love them and that you died for them and that, Lord, you truly will forgive them of every single thing they have done or ever will do. You paid for it all 2,000 years ago before they were born. So if there's one in this church today that would say, Brother Dave, I believe God is telling me that I need to repent. I need to be willing to turn from the and surrender all of me to all of him in a real way. I want you to pray this with me. Now this prayer is not a magic formula. This prayer in and of itself does not save you. A preacher doesn't save you. Walking down an aisle doesn't save you. Jesus Christ is the one and the only one that can save you. And he knows your heart. 
But if you feel the need to say, God, I, I want to be saved. I, I, I want to truly be forgiven. I want heaven as my home. Then I want you to pray this with me. And he's looking at your heart. You don't have to repeat everything I say. But dear Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you are God. And I believe that you came to this world and that you lived a perfect life. And I believe that you went to Calvary's cross. And on that cross, you took all my sins, past, present, and future. And while you were dying on that cross for my sins, receiving all my punishment, I believe that you died. I believe that you were buried. And Lord Jesus, I believe that you were raised from the dead by God on the third day. I believe that with all my heart. I'm confessing you as Lord. And Lord, right now, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm willing to turn from my sin and self. And I'm asking you to change my heart and life forever. And would there be anybody in this room, no one looking around, that would say, Brother Dave, I prayed to receive Christ and his salvation in a real way today. Just simply raise your hand. Anybody say, Brother Dave, I prayed to receive Christ in a real way today for the first time. Anybody at all? All right, church, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as the piano begins to play. And as we're about to sing our invitation song, here's what I want you to do as you stand to your feet. If God has spoken to your heart in any way today, I want you, if you're able to come, come to these altars and pray and say, God, thank you for speaking to my heart today. Thank you for speaking to me today. Number two, Lord, I need you to supernaturally in me and through me do what it is that you laid on my heart that I need to do. And then number three, just come and just say thank you for his love. Say thank you for his salvation. Say thank you for the privilege that we have the gospel and that we can share that with others. There might be a soul, there might be a burden on your heart also. Come and give that to him. The Bible says that cast all your burdens upon him for he cares for you, says the Lord. And remember, if God's convicted you of any sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, if we'll confess that to him. He loves you today, he cares for you today. He wants you to be different, changed, and refreshed today. So this is your time and His now. So come. I'll pray with you if you need prayer as well, but these altars are open. Come. It's not too late to be saved. Come.